Welcome everyone. Today I'll be talking about the sponsored search markets. This is a really interesting topic, something that we can relate to our everyday life. We know that the majority share of Google's income comes from web search. The question is, how do they make money? Well, it turns out that for the things that we Google, for example, pizza, there are a lot of companies that, uh, for example, Pizza Hut, Domino's Pizza, Papa John's, all of these companies are fighting for advertisement spots on Google's web page. And this essentially led to a completely new type of market at the beginning of the 21st century, which we'll be studying today. And if we go back to the earlier years of the internet, advertisement was still there. However, there was essentially no difference between advertisement on the internet and advertisement in other media, for example, newspapers or TV. I can give you one example from my um, uh, personal experience. Years ago, I used to have a Yahoo email account. And whenever I logged into that Yahoo account, I was shown an advertisement on the right hand side. And that advertisement was for some weight loss product. And there they showed a cartoon of a half naked man who had a huge beer belly. And they also had an animation like how taking that weight, weight loss uh, product slain that guy down. To me that advertisement was completely irrelevant. Not only that, whoever was advertising that on Yahoo was wasting their money. Because among the whole internet population, a tiny fraction of that population might be interested in buying their product. So now there's, here's the question. How do you use user-generated data to make advertisement to make advertisement more relevant to the user? And the first company that had this idea of a keyword-based search is, is Overchar Services. And incidentally, that company in 2003, that company was bought out by Yahoo for over $1.6 billion. Okay? So before we study this, uh, this uh, keyword-based search and the economy behind it, uh, we, need to, we need to know a few terminologies and a few uh, conventions in the search world. So next I'm going to go to the board and write down some of the conventions and terminology. Here I'll be talking from chapter 15 of Easley Kleinberg's Networks book. First of all, some conventions. Number one convention that I wrote down is pay per click. It means that if Pizza Hut uh, advertises on Google, they'll be paying Google on a per click basis. If nobody clicks on their advertisement, Pizza Hut will be paying Google nothing. Okay. Number two convention that I've written is price setting by auction. It means how much Pizza Hut would be uh, paying Google depends on an auction mechanism. Well, you can also think about an, an alternative mechanism where Google posts some fixed prices. For example, for pizza, for the keyword pizza, for per click basis, uh, uh, Pizza Hut will have to pay, let's say, one dollar per click. For some, some other keyword, for example, <coughs> uh, main vacation, everybody will have to pay, let's say, two dollars per click. Okay. However, that scheme uh, is troublesome because there are way too many search keywords, thousands of them. Okay. So managing all of these search keywords and managing the fixed price for these keywords would be next to impossible for Google. Okay. So what Google does is that uh, Google does price setting by an auction mechanism. And the prices, as you can imagine, depend on search keyword, definitely. Well, one example is main vacation. For vacation websites or vacation advertisements, usually the rate is one and a half dollars per click. Okay? For other websites, for example, uh, all of us who live in Brunswick, Topsom area, we've received this uh, advertisement from Joe Bornstein's law offices. And here this advertisement is for asbestos related lung cancer which is known as mesotheli mesothelioma. Okay? For mesothelioma, you can, if you search for mesothelioma on Google, uh, you'll see a listing of different law offices. And if you click on any one of those law offices, usually the, uh, the going rate is around $50. Okay? $50 per click. So as soon as you click on some law offices website on, from the advertisement shown, $50 will, will get transmitted from that law office's office to Google's headquarters. So that's a lot of money, right? Yes, uh, these law offices can afford to pay that, mu pay that much is because they have in expectation they earn way more than that, okay? So this how much uh, the company should pay, uh, pay Google is determined by, by an auction, okay? <clears throat> now what auction mechanism would you use? You can think of some alternative, for example, first price auction, 
second price auction. We've known about these two main mechanisms of auctions. And we know that second price of auction has some <coughs> nice properties. For example, it elicits truthfulness from the bidders. And in fact, bidding truthful, uh, truthfully is a dominant strategy. We theoretically proved it. Okay? So we might want to uh, approach it uh, in a second price auction. Second price auction. Now, the problem with second price auction, for example, second price sealed bid auction, is that it only talks about one, uh, one item, okay? Just one item. However, if you look at Google's uh, search, they, are, they have multiple slots, multiple slots for advertisement, multiple advertisement spots, okay? So, in other words, <coughs> excuse me, if you see three uh, spots on Google's uh, search, uh, Google search, it means that Google is trying to sell three items, okay? Now, uh, second price sale bid auction, this procedure cannot ha handle multiple, uh, multiple items. And there are two main uh, generalization of this second price uh, sale bid auction. One is known as VCG auction, VCG, which stands for Vickrey, Clark, Groups auction, and the other one is known as GSP, and GSP stands for Generalized Second Price Auction. Second Price Auction. Let's do it right. Generalized Second. GSP, okay, and we'll look at how uh, this auction, uh, second price auction, this for just one item, and these are for multiple items, and how these generalizations are made. To give you a heads up, uh, VCG, this Vickery Clark Groups auction, it has many interesting properties. It also elicits uh, truthfulness from the bidders, and uh, however, this GSP auction. Uh, here we'll see that uh, bidders will have incentive to lie, okay? And also GSP auction is not, um, in many cases, GSP auctions are not socially optimal, okay? It does not maximize social welfare. And uh, so which one is applied in practice? Well, interestingly, GSP is the one that is applied in practice. So Google, Bing, all of them are applying this GSP search. Uh, GSP auction mechanism okay although it does not elicit truthfulness it does not maximize social welfare still it is the one that is being applied okay now uh, there are a few things that we need to uh, the study a few terminology that we need to study before we can go into VCG and GSP and even before we go into GSP and VCG we'll actually talk a little bit about matching market this is the other thing that we talked about while we talked about things like market clearing price, perfect matching, things like this. So we'll talk about those things before going into VCG and GSP, okay? There are two terms that we'll be using a lot. One is called the click-through rate, or in short, I'm calling it CTR. CTR means the number of clicks per hour associated with a slot. So here, this is important. So this notion of CTR is relevant to a slot. Uh, let's say in Google, we have three slots. One, two, three. One is appearing high, two next, three the lowest slot, okay? So presumably the ones that are higher up will attract a lot of um, more clicks, right? So the CTR for slot number one, let's say this is 10. C uh, this means uh, the advertisement on slot number one will have 10 clicks per hour, okay? Uh, 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 slot number two, CTR is five, five clicks per hour. Slot number three, two clicks per hour, okay? Now there are a few simplifying assumptions. One assumption is that all of the advertisers or bidders know this CTR information, okay? Usually this is true because uh, the search companies like Google, they provide advertisers uh, some tools and using those tools, the advertisers can see like historical data, like what was the click-through rate for the slot number one, slot number two, slot number three, and so on, okay? Now the other two assumptions are a little bit drastic. One assumption is that the CTR, this click-through rate, only depends on the slot number and does not at all depend on the advertiser. Okay. So in other words, uh, it ignore it kind of ignores the relevance of advertisement. Okay.
okay? So let's say you are searching for pizza, okay? Then slot number one uh, is an advertisement for some shoe. So you're never going to click on uh, slot number one, okay? Whoever advertises, advertises at slot number one will not get any click, okay? However, the assumption here is that this is CTR does not depend on the advertisement, does not depend on the relevance of the ad advertisement. It is only dependent on the slot. This is a simplifying assumption, okay? The third simplifying assumption is that the CTR for a slot, for example, slot number one, does not depend on the advertisements that are going on in slot number two and three, okay? And actually this, uh, this third point, uh, that is how the CTR depends on the uh, advertisements shown on the other slots, this is not well understood even, even uh, from Google or other search, um, uh, search engines, okay? So these are the simplifying assumptions. In brief, CTR only depends on the slot, okay? Now the next term that I have here is revenue per click. It means the advertiser's estimated revenue, dollar amount per click, okay? And it does not depend on the slot. Again, the same kind of assumption. Um, the, if you go, uh, if you look at this side of the, this column, here I have the advertisers X, Y, and Z. Uh, advertiser X gets three dollars per click. It does not depend on whether advertiser X is placed on slot one or whether this guy is placed on slot two or three. Does not matter. All it matters is that for every click, advertiser X can expect three dollars of revenue. Okay. Similarly, advertiser Y, his revenue per click is two dollars. Okay. So again, it does not matter whether advertiser Y is placed in slot one or slot 2 or slot 3 does not matter all that matters is um, this uh, revenue of dollar amount per click okay <clears throat> now with these uh, two notions we can actually form a matching market between buyers and sellers well first of all you might ask this question like uh, um, in in this kind of a scenario let's say google only has three slots but there are lots of different advertisers interested in uh, advertising their uh, product in these three slots. Let's say there are three slots and ten advertisers. How do you do? Matching market, we know that in matching market the number of buyers and the number of sellers will have to be the same. Otherwise you cannot talk about matching market. Well one idea could be you could have dummy items, right? You could have dummy slots. Let's say there are three slots, however there are ten advertisers. In that case you'll add seven dummy slots, okay? And all of these dummy slots will have CTR of zero, right? Because these are dummy, these do not exist, these slots do not exist. As a result, the CTR for these dummies would be zero, okay? And similarly, you can also account, uh, account for the other type of imbalance. Let's say there are way too many slots, but too few advertisers. In that case, you can add some dummy advertisers just to equalize these two sets, okay? From our study of matching markets, we know that in a matching market formulation, there are basically four columns. Number one column is for prices, and number two column is for the items. Okay, so each item will have an associated price. Number three column is for the buyers. Okay, and number four column is for buyers' valuations for the items. Well, now if you think about uh, uh, this setting, like the uh, uh, search market, sponsored search market setting. Here we obviously we have two additional columns. One is for the CTRs of these slots and the other one is for the revenue per click uh, of, the, uh, of the advertisers, okay? Now, how do you actually uh, use these uh, two pieces of information to derive the buyer's valuations for the slots, okay? One way could be like this. An advertiser's valuation for a slot is equal to the CTR of that slot times that advertiser's revenue per click. What it is saying is that uh, an advertiser's valuation for a particular slot is exactly the dollar amount that that slot will bring per hour, okay? So in other words, if you, uh, let's look at this case here. Let's say a advertiser X is placed into slot one, okay? So this is the outcome. In that case, uh, advertiser X will get 10 clicks per hour. And each of these 10 clicks will bring this advertiser $3 per click, right? So 3 times 10, that is $30 per hour. So that is the dollar amount that the advertiser gets 
by being placed into a slot number one, thirty dollars per hour. Okay. Now think about another case like. Uh, this advertiser is placed into slot number two. In that case, what would be his valuation? Well, in this case, uh, a slot number two brings five clicks per hour. Okay, and for each click, this advertiser X is getting three dollars per click. So three times five, that is fifteen dollars per hour. So advertiser X's valuation for this slot number two would be fifteen dollars per hour. Okay. So next, in this column, I'm going to write down all of these valuations in this fashion. So I have the valuations in black and payoffs in parentheses also in red. We'll fill out all of those things. So first of all, for advertiser X. Okay. So uh, valuation for uh, valuation of advertiser X for slot number one is three times ten. That is thirty. It actually means thirty dollars per hour. Okay. So I'm going to omit this dollar sign as well as as well as this uh, per hour uh, this notion, but it actually means thirty dollars per hour. Next, three times five is the valuation for slot number two. Access valuation for slot number two. Next one is three times two. That is access valuation for slot number three. And similarly, I I, I can fill out the rest of the things. Now let's think about uh, advertiser Y. Advertiser Y's valuation for slot number one would be two times ten, that is twenty, twenty dollars per hour. Similarly, two times five, ten dollars per hour. Two times two, four dollars per hour. Now Z, one times ten, ten dollars per hour. Uh, one times five, five dollars per hour. Uh, one times uh, two, two dollars per hour. Okay. So these are the uh, valuations of the advertisers for each slot. Okay. Now, once you have this valuation, you can just ignore this column here, revenue per click. You can also ignore this column, CTR. And you have the, you have the uh, a problem for matching market, right? Matching market. And how do you, uh, uh, what is the uh, solution concept in matching market? Well, the most desirable solution, con uh, solution is market clearing price. A set of prices for which there exists a perfect matching in this, in the preferred seller graph. Okay, and the market clearing price has many desirable properties. One of them is that in a market clearing price, each buyer or each advertiser will be maximizing uh, maximizing his own payoff. Not only that, market clearing price also guarantees social welfare maximization. Social welfare maximization means at that price point. The sum of valuations, the sum of these numbers here, sum of the valuations will be the maximum possible, okay? And that social welfare maximizing as a maximization, as you recall, does not have any, uh, does not account for the payoffs, okay? And how do you how do you compute a market clearing price? Well, we studied a, an auction algorithm for uh, constructing a market clearing price, okay? And if you apply that auction algorithm here, you end up with these prices here, thirteen for this slot number one and the three for slot number two and zero for slot number three uh, okay uh, so at this pr uh, price so let's uh, look at the uh, payoffs for these prices okay so let's say uh, these are the prices here now we would like to compute the payoffs so again the unit of the prices is a dollar per hour okay so this is the unit of the prices which is at the same unit as the valuations. Okay. So let's go and compute the payoffs here. Uh, so let's say uh, this advertiser X is thinking about uh, getting into uh, buying this slot number one. In that case, he has to pay $13 per hour. His valuation is $30 per hour. So the difference between these two is his payoff. 30 minus 13 is $17 per hour, right? Now, similarly, advertiser X's uh, payoff for slot number two is 15 minus three, okay? So that gives you 12, $12 per hour. Advertiser X's payoff for slot number three is six here minus zero, okay? So that gives him $6 per hour, okay? Now, these are the payoffs, 17, 12, six. Uh, what would be the edges in the preferred seller graph? Well, we know that each buyer, in this case, each advertiser, 
will only be thinking about maximizing his payoff okay and the slot that maximizes the payoff is slot number one right so there will be only one edge here connected to x that edge connects x to x to one okay we'll do similar computation for y so let's compute y's payoffs first uh, slot number one payoff for slot number one is 20 minus 13 that is 7 okay slot number 2 10 minus 3 that is 7 slot number 3 4 minus 0 that is 4 okay now uh, wh what would be the edges that will be in the uh, preferred seller group well uh, uh, advertiser y is thinking about maximizing his payoff he gets the same payoff from slot number 1 as well as slot number 2 Okay, so as, as a result, he'll have two edges. One edge will go to slot number one, the other one will go to slot number two. Okay. Similarly, let's uh, do uh, for Z here. Uh, Z's payoff for slot number one would be one, uh, I'm sorry, would be 10 minus 13, that is negative three. Slot number two would be five minus three, that is two. Slot number three, it will be 2 minus 0, that will be 2, okay? Once again for Z, uh, the slots that maximize uh, his payoffs uh, are slot number 2 and 3. So he will have two edges, one going to 2 and the other going to 3, okay? So this is these red edges and these nodes, these uh, give you the preferred seller graph. Now is there a perfect matching here? Yes, there is a perfect matching here. And I'm going to draw the perfect matching using the wiggly uh, lines here. So this is a perfect matching which assigns slot number x to 1, slot number uh, 2 uh, to y and slot number 3 to z. Okay? So this is the, uh, this is the perfect matching gave, uh, given by the MCP. And we also know that whenever there exists a perfect matching, this set of prices will be called market clearing prices, MCP. Okay. Now uh, everything looks uh, good so far. We can uh, we can take care of imbalance between number of slots and advertisers, and we can compute a, a price here. Uh, for example, this MCP that gives all of the desirable properties, like it will maximize the social welfare, as well as at this MCP, each buyer or each advertiser is maximizing his own payoff. So what's wrong with this? Uh, approach well the problem with this approach is that these advertisers uh, they are never going to tell Google their valuations okay so in other words Google needs that valuation information like 30 15 6 20 10 4 Google really needs these numbers to compute these prices 1330 this MCP if you do not have those numbers you cannot compute the prices okay so this is the problem and because of this problem, this matching market formulation does not work in real, real world, okay? So now we can think about uh, generalizing the uh, second price auction. As I said, there are two possibilities. One is known as VCG auction. The other one is known as GSP auction, okay? So we'll first look at VCG auction, which has many desirable properties, including truthfulness. And the other one, then we'll look at GSP. And although it does not uh, elicit truthfulness, it still is the one that is applied in practice, okay? We'll now study VCG mechanism. VCG mechanism generalizes second price seal bid auction in a way that preserves all of the desirable property that we saw in second price seal bid auction. And in particular, VCG mechanism is applicable to multiple items. Uh, and in this mechanism, it is a dominant strategy for each bidder and in our case for each advertiser to come forward with their truthful valuations. In other words, they'll bid their true valuations. Okay. So to gather some intuition into this VCG mechanism, we'll go back to second price seal bid auction. And here, uh, this, this picture is for second price seal bid auction. Here we have just one item here, item one, and we have three bidders, X, Y, and Z. Okay. And the valuations for these three bidders are, for X's valuation for item one is 10, Y's valuation 5, Z's valuation $2, okay? 
Now, uh, if they, uh, we know that it is each bidder's dominant strategy to bid truthfully. As a result, X will bid $10 for this item, Y will bid $5, Z will bid $2. Okay? Now, what would be the outcome of this auction? Well, here, uh, the highest bidder, X is the highest bidder, X will win the auction. However, X will pay the second highest bidder's uh, bid. In other words, X will be paying $5. Okay? Now, um, and we, uh, there are two things that we can notice here. First of all, second price sale bid auction maximizes social welfare. Well, what do I mean by it? Well, here, this is, the, uh, this is what is happening here. So, X gets item number one. And the valuation that this uh, edge gives you is 10. And this is the maximum valuation. If you give this item number one to Y, you will end up with a valuation of 5, lower than 10. Similarly, if you give it to Z, you'll end up with even, even lower valuation, like 2. So in other words, second price sale bid auction maximizes social welfare, maximizes the valuation. Okay. Now the second interesting property is that it's not at all obvious. And this is, I mean, this is an amazing idea by Clark and groups who designed this VCG mechanism. And the, uh, the idea is comes from a, a different way of looking at second price sale bid auction. Okay. Now if you look at X here, X is paying $5 for this item 1. You might ask why? Why $5? Well, one might argue that X is causing a harm of $5 to the rest of the bidders. Okay. So what do I mean by harm? Well, if X were not there, let's say X is not there in, the, in this auction. Okay. So I can actually cross out X. Let's say X is not there in, the, in this auction. In that case, who would have won the auction? Well, Y would have won the auction. And uh, Y would get the item. And Y would have paid two, two dollars. Okay? Now, because of the presence of X, Y is getting, uh, Y cannot get hold of this item, which he values at five dollars. Okay? In other words, X's presence causes Y a harm of how much? causes a Y a harm of $5 because that's the valuation Y has for this item. Similarly, X's absence how, uh, causes a harm to Z. And how much is that harm? Well, we'll see that this harm is zero. Why zero? Well, again, let's say X is not there in the auction. Okay. Now, Y and Z are bidding for this item. Obviously, Y is the higher between the two bidders. So, Y will get the item and Z will not get the item. So it does not matter whether X is in the auction or X is not in the auction, Z is never going to get this item, okay? So X is not causing Z any harm. In other words, X is causing Z a harm of zero dollars, okay? Now this is the second way of looking at things that led to the uh, VCG mechanism, okay? So we'll look at another example where we'll have multiple items and we'll calculate this notion of harm, like the uh, uh, will charge an advertiser an amount that will be equal to the harm that he causes to the other advertisers. Okay, and the way to calculate this harm is first of all we'll do all of the calculations with that advertiser present there, and secondly we'll exclude that advertiser. We'll delete him from the uh, from from our model. Then we'll calculate another outcome, and in that outcome we'll see how much the other guys are getting. And the difference between these two will be the harm caused by an advertiser, just like this. First of all, we'll calculate the outcome of the auction with X present there. And in that case, Y, Z, they, they do not get the uh, item. Secondly, we'll uh, delete, we'll cross out X from the auction. Okay, And now, Y would get the item. And Y values the item at 5. Okay, So X's presence causes Y a harm of $5. And as we saw earlier, X's presence does not cause Z any harm at all. Okay? So the sum, sum of all harm done by X's presence is 5 plus 0. That is $5. And X is uh, paying $5. Okay? So let's uh, go and we'll uh, look at another example, a more detailed example here.
So I have the VCG principle written here. It says each beater is charged the harm it causes to others. Okay. And what is the definition of harm? Harm means the total amount everyone would be better off if that beater was not present. Okay. And we'll see an example of this uh, VCG principle. But before that, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the steps in VCG mechanism. Okay. The number one step here is Google will ask each bidder or each advertiser to report their valuations. Okay. And will not approve it theoretically, but in, uh, in VCG mechanism, it is a dominant strategy for each uh, advertiser to bid their own true valuations. Okay. And number two step here is to compute a socially optimal assignment. Okay. So how do you do that? Well, let's uh, look at this example here. We have three slots here and three advertisers here, okay? And the, uh, as part of step number one, the advertisers have uh, reported their valuations. For example, X has reported uh, X has valuations 30 for slot one, 15 for slot two, six for slot three, and so on for Y and Z, okay? And what would be a, a socially optimal assignment here? Socially optimal assignment is uh, given in uh, by these blue lines here. So in this optimal, in this assignment here, X is getting a valuation of 30 because X is getting item number uh, slot 1. Y, Y's valuation here is 10 because Y is getting slot number 2. And Z's valuation is 2 because Z is getting slot number 3. So now uh, you should ask this question like how do I calculate this kind of a socially optimal assignment? Okay. So the one way of calculating this socially optimal assignment is to apply the MCP uh, uh, construction algorithm. Okay. So we know that when we have valuations like this, we have a set of items and buyers. We can calculate the MCP, market clearing prices, using an auction algorithm. Okay. And that using that auction algorithm, MCP guarantees a perfect matching in the preferred seller graph. And this is one perfect matching in that preferred seller graph. Okay. Now the other thing here is that if you notice here, I do not I did not write down the MCPs here. Why? Because MCPs, market clearing prices, are completely irrelevant here. Uh, we have a different uh, notion of price. It's called VCG price, okay? So we can use the MCP construction algorithm for, uh, uh, for step number two for calculating the socially optimal assignment, but we are never going to use the MCPs. We are never going to use the market clearing prices, okay? Now, uh, step number two gives us this assignment. And step number three says, charge VCG prices. Now, here's the, uh, uh, now we have to deal with the notion of harm here. And so let's think about like how much we should charge X. Okay. So X is getting item, item number one, Y is getting item number two, Z item number three. So how much should X pay? Okay. So X should pay according to this principle, the harm X causes to Y and Z. Okay. So how, uh, how do we calculate the harm X causes to Y and Z? Uh, well, for that, first of all, you have to exclude X from the auction, okay? So here, we'll write down similar thing. Now here, we'll have a picture without X. Without X, okay. Now, without X, you'll have the same items here. The slots will be the same. One, two, three. Now, there are just two bidders or two advertisers, Y and Z. Okay. X is gone. Okay. Now the valuations will not change. Valuations will remain the same. 20, 10, 4, and 10, 5, 2. Okay. The valuations remain the same. Now do the same kind of assignment. What is the socially optimal assignment here? Well, obviously, you can first of all, you can see that there is an imbalance between the items and the uh, buyers uh, or the advertisers. But you can take, uh, you can, you can actually take care of it by easily by adding a new dummy uh, advertiser. But that will not be actually necessary. Okay, so we can do some hand calculation here, and we can see that if you assign slot number one to Y and slot number two to Z, your total valuation would be 20 plus five. That is 25. There exists no other assignment that gives you more than 25. Okay, so this assignment giving slot 1 to y and slot 2 to z is socially optimal when x is not there okay x is not here okay now uh, so if you compare these two scenarios here scenario 1 when x is there scenario 2 when x is not there okay 
So uh, when x is not there, y could get a valuation of 20. However, when x is there, y is getting only 10. What is the difference? 20 minus 10, 10. Okay? So in other words, x is causing y a harm of $10 per hour. Okay. Similarly, uh, if you look at z here, right now z is getting $5 per hour. That's valuation. Okay? Uh, however, when x is there in the auction, uh, uh, in that case, z is getting only $2 per hour. So what is the difference? 5 minus 2, that is $3 per hour. So in other words, x is causing z a harm of $2, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 5 minus 2, that is 3, $3 per hour, okay? And what is the total sum of all of the harms? Well, $10 for uh, y and $3 for z, in total $13. Okay, so $13 is the total harm X causes to the other guys. And VCG principles tells us X should pay $13. Okay, so let me write it down. So um, here we, we know X harms Y by, uh, we have 20 here minus 10 here. That is 20. Okay. Similarly, x harms z by $5 here minus $2 here. 5 minus 2, that is 3. Okay. Total harm caused by x by x is, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. So 20 minus 10, this should be 10 here. Total harm caused by x is 13, and according to the VCG principle, x pays 13, okay? x pays uh, this amount uh, for getting uh, slot number 1. Similarly, you can calculate how much y, uh, y gets. For that, first of all, we have this picture, and then you need another picture where y will not be there. There you will have without y, okay, without y, then calculate the total harm, and that would be the amount that y will be paying, and if I look at my notes here, uh, for this example, y will be paying $3, and z will be paying $0, okay, so verify that you get y's, the total harm caused by y is $3, and the total harm caused by z is $0, verify it, okay. Now, uh, this, as I, as I said at the beginning, VCG mechanism preserves all of the desirable properties of a second price uh, sale bid auction. However, this is not practically implemented. One reason could be this harm calculation. This is not at all intuitive. It does not come to our human mind at the beginning. And uh, the, the other thing uh, here is that uh, um, the search companies would not be able to explain this pricing mechanism well to the advertisers okay so the search company might say well x might say might tell x you'll be paying 13 dollars because this is the harm you are causing to y and z then x might come back and say i'm an honest businessman i'm not causing any harm to anyone okay so in other words it's hard to explain the, this mechanism and as a result in real world what is applied is what we are going to do next gsp generalized second price auction okay We'll now look at the GSP mechanism, and if you look at the board, I've written superficially GSP, superficially generalized second price auction. The reason is that although the name GSP suggests it's a generalization of the second price sealed bid auction, in reality it is not. It does not preserve all of the nice properties that second price sealed bid auction has. Okay, so let's look at the two steps of GSP mechanism. <coughs> Excuse me. In the first step, Google will ask every advertiser to report their revenue per click. And this <coughs> revenue per click is considered to be a bid. Okay. Now look at the difference between GSP and VCG. In VCG, Google would have asked each advertiser to report their valuations. And if there are three uh, slots, each advertiser will have to mention three numbers, three valuations for these three slots. Okay. So each valuation means that advertiser's uh, <coughs> dollar amount per hour for uh, that particular slot. Okay. Now here, uh, this bid is much simpler. Here, it, uh, each advertiser would be reporting the revenue per click. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and uh, and also look at the difference between the unit here the unit here unit of bid revenue per click is dollar amount per click whereas in valuations the unit is dollar amount per hour okay now step number two says uh, Google will assign ith slot in the advertisement uh, to the ith highest bidder and this ith highest bidder will not pay his own bid he will actually pay the bid of the i plus first highest bid bidder okay and in a sense it can it kind of uh, emulates what happens in second price sealed bid auction uh, the winning bidder does not pay his own bid he actually pays the next guy's bid okay now uh, the formal analysis of this gsp auction uh, has been done uh, uh, around a decade ago and uh, some of the leaders in this analysis uh, are Hal Varian, uh, Ostrovsky, Edelman and Schwartz. Okay, So there are some nice uh, stories behind this analysis. Hal Varian was a professor at UC Berkeley and he went to Google in his sabbatical year. Okay, There he implemented and analyzed the GSP uh, mechanism as part of Google's uh, AdWords search auction. And later on, he, uh, he sought permission to uh, publish his paper, but Google said, no, this is our trade secret, you cannot publish this paper. And a few years went by, and in 2007, the same kind of analysis of this same mechanism, GSP, was published by a few people working for uh, Yahoo. And uh, those three people are Edelman, Schwarz, and Ostrovsky. Okay? Then, uh, then uh, Hal Varian went back to Google and asked, like, well, look at this. These guys are already publishing the same thing that I worked on, GSP. Okay? Now, can I publish my paper now? Then Google said, yes, you can. So in 2007, <coughs> independently, Hal Varian also published his work on GSP mechanism. And <coughs> later on, just a few years ago, <coughs> in this uh, Stony Brook's Game Theory Festival, these two papers, uh, these two 2007 papers, one paper by Halvarian and the other paper by uh, uh, Edelman, Ostrovsky and Shores. These two papers won the award for uh, being the uh, most influential paper uh, in game theory. Okay? Now, uh, the analysis, the formal analysis of this GSP mechanism is via game. Okay? So, uh, first of all, what are the players in this game? The players are the advertisers. Okay? And uh, what are their strategies? Their strategies are bids. And in this case, the bids mean revenue per click. Okay? And uh, what are their payoffs? Well, the payoffs are calculated as revenue minus price. Okay? And the unit of this payoff is dollar amount per click. Okay? <coughs> so first of all, in this game, I'm going to give you some summary of the results. Uh, uh, some downsides, some disadvantages of this game. Number one disadvantage is uh, Nash equilibrium may not be truth telling okay there might be incentive to lie so you might see a Nash equilibrium where the uh, advertisers are reporting under reporting their revenue revenue per click okay so that can happen number two uh, uh, disadvantage is that at a Nash equilibrium there is no guarantee that the outcome would be socially optimal okay in other words uh, there is no guarantee that the uh, assignment would lead to a uh, maximization of valuation, some of the valuations of the advertisers. Okay, so there is no guarantee of social welfare maximization. And in VCG, there was such a guarantee. Okay, VCG or MCP, there was always a guarantee of social optimal, uh, social optimality. Okay, now the other uh, downside is that uh, there could be multiple Nash equilibria. Okay, multiple Nash equilibria. So uh, you cannot foretell, you cannot predict which one would happen. Okay, there could be multiple possibilities. Okay, so these are the three main disadvantages. Uh, on the upside, there are some advantages. First of all, uh, th there is a, a theoretical proof that there exists at least one Nash equilibrium. Okay, at least one Nash equilibrium. And also the other upside is that one of these Nash equilibria, there could be many, but one of them is socially optimal. Okay. In other words, one of the Nash equilibrium for sure maximizes the sum of the valuations at that particular assignment. Okay. Now, uh, now I'll show you a few examples of this game and what I mean by Nash equilibrium. Well, we know that we, the concept of Nash equilibrium is nobody will have any incentive to deviate from that strategy. In other words, nobody will have any incentive. Nobody will gain anything 
by changing their bid, which is revenue per click. Okay, so that would be the concept of uh, Nash equilibrium. Okay, so let's uh, go for uh, with uh, I'll first show a few examples. The first example is I'll show you uh, in a Nash equilibrium in a uh, in this kind of a game, the advertisers might have incentive to lie. Okay, so this is the first example, and this. Uh, Setting is not true. Not true. Okay. So for this setting, I'll have, uh, let's say we have two slots, okay? Two slots, and we have three uh, bidders or three advertisers. And these two slots are uh, here, one, two, and the advertisers are X, Y, and Z. Okay. Now I'll also write down the uh, CTR of these slots. Here, these are the slots, and these are the advertisers. And of course, we need to talk about the CTR of each slot here. CTR of the first slot is 10, the second one is 4. And we also need to talk about the true, uh, true revenue per click of each bidder. Okay. Uh, so let's assume the revenues per click are uh, $7 per click, $6 per click, and $1 per click. Okay, 7, 6, 1. So these are the revenues uh, per click of, of the advertisers. Okay. Now this is the input to the problem and first of all you can notice an imbalance between the uh, number of slots and number of advertisers. And we know one common way of uh, 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 countering this imbalance is you can add a dummy node or a dummy slot here which will have a revenue uh, which will have a CTR of zero. Okay. Now you get a complete balance. The number of slots is exactly equal to the number of advertisers. Okay. Now we can do multi-item auction on this using the GSP mechanism. Well, the input, uh, the first step in the GSP mechanism is ask for revenue per click, okay, which will be denoted as B. So let me add another column here, which is B. Okay. And let's first assume everybody is truthful. Okay. Truthful means everybody will be will bid their True value, uh, true revenue per click. Seven, six, one. So everybody is truthful. Reported their true revenue per click as their bid. And now what happens? Okay. So uh, and the second step here says assign the highest slot to the highest highest bidder. So who is the highest bidder? X is the highest bidder with the bid of seven. Okay. So X will get the number one slot. Okay. X gets number one slot. Y is the second highest bidder, gets the number two slot. Z is the third highest bidder, gets the number three slot. Okay? And how much X pays here? X will pay the bid of Y. In other words, X will pay six. How much will Y pay? Y will pay Z's bid. In other words, Y will pay one uh, one dollar per click. Okay? And how much will Z pay? Uh, there is nothing below it, so Z will pay zero dollars per click. Okay? And so this is the this is the outcome here, uh, based on the bids. Now one question is: Is this a Nash equilibrium? In other words, does anyone have an incentive to deviate from, uh, the unilaterally deviate from these uh, bids? Well, we can show that yes, X in fact has uh, has incentive to deviate. And uh, the way we can uh, show it is: first of all, we'll calculate access payoff for this outcome. So let me write it down. Access payoff. Uh, in the truthful bidding case is so X uh, will gain access income or revenue would be seven dollars per click. However, X will be paying six dollars per click because X pays the next guy's bid okay so um, access uh, revenue per click would be seven minus six one dollar per click and this one dollar per click 
if you translate it to uh, dollars per hour, what would be that? Well, X will be getting 10 clicks per hour, okay? For each click, X is payoff is $1 per click, okay? So if you multiply 10 by 1, you get $10 per hour, okay? So this is $10 per hour, okay? So X will get $10 per hour. Now let's uh, look at the alternative scenario. Like X actually lies, okay? So uh, one way of lying could be X is top ranked advertiser right now, and X would deliberately go to second rank, okay? Second rank advertiser. And for that, X will beat something below wild speed, okay? So let's look at this uh, scenario. Let's say X, uh, now everything for the alternative scenario, I'm going to write in red here. Let's say instead of seven, X beats five, which is below this six, okay? And Y beats the same thing, six, and Z beats the same thing, one, uh, one dollar per click. Okay, so the only change is in X. This is the alternative scenario. Okay. Now, what would be the outcome here? Well, X is no longer number one beater, no longer the highest beater. Who is the highest beater? Highest beater is Y. So as a result, this uh, assignment will get changed. Okay. So let me write the new assignment in red here. So X will be assigned, uh, Y will be assigned the slot number one because Y is the highest bidder uh, with a bid of six and X will get the second highest, uh, second slot because X is the second highest bidder and Z will get uh, the uh, uh, third slot and uh, so let's think about like X's payoff right now. Okay. So X is uh, bidding five dollars per click but X will pay the next highest guy's bidder. And who is the next highest guy? Well, Z is the next highest guy, okay? And Z's bid is $1 per click. In other words, X will be uh, paying $1 per click, okay? So let, let's write down X's payoff. X's payoff in the uh, not truthful case. Not truthful. In the not truthful case, what would be X's payoff? First of all, let's think about revenue per click, okay? Access revenue per click is $7 per click. This does not change. This is the true revenue per click, okay? So, uh, $7 per click, and X is paying $1 per click. X will be paying Z's bid, okay? So, 7 minus 1 uh, per click. So, that gives you $6 per click. And if you translate it to a dollar amount per hour, you have to look at the CTR. Well, X is getting slot number two, and for slot number two, the CTR click-through rate is four. Means that X will be getting four clicks per hour, okay? Now, for each click, X will be getting a profit of six dollars uh, per click, okay? And if you multiply this six by this four, you get twenty-four dollars per hour, okay? So let's, uh, let me write it down, twenty-four dollar, Per hour, okay. So that would be access payoff in the not truthful case. Now, if you look at these two two scenarios, in the first scenario, X being truthful, X was getting ten dollars per hour. Now, as soon as X started lying, X is getting a more more dollar amount, like twenty four dollars per hour. Okay, so there is certainly incentive to deviate. As a result, the earlier case, the truthful case that we showed, is not an Nash equilibrium, is because X has incentive to deviate, okay? Now, do not take it as, an, as a universal example. Uh, in other words, do not, uh, do not take it like every Nash equilibrium. In every Nash equilibrium, people will be lying, not like that, okay? There could be Nash equilibrium where people would be truthful. There could be examples like this. But uh, there is no guarantee that in a Nash equilibrium, everybody would be truthful. That is the point, okay? Now, uh, the other point that we talked about is multiplicity of Nash equilibrium. Like in, uh, in this kind of scenario, uh, there could be multiple Nash equilibrium and you don't know which one would happen. This is the other disadvantage of this GSP auction, okay? Now I'll give you an example of this multiplicity of Nash equilibrium and uh, how to argue about Nash equilibrium in the GSP setting. So for that example, we'll have exactly the same kind of scenario like two slots and three uh, advertisers here and one of the slots will add one slot that is kind of the dummy slot 
and I'm going to erase all of these things here. And let's assume we have the same CTR, same revenue per click, all of these things uh, would be the same, and we'll be just changing the bids here. Okay. And this example is for multiple Nash equilibrium. Multiple Nash equilibrium. And one equilibrium in this case is uh, 5, 4, 1. Okay, so let me write it down. 5, 4, 1. My claim is that uh, this scenario, when X beats $5 per click, Y beats $4 per click, and Z beats $1 per click, this scenario is a Nash equilibrium. So how do I prove this is a Nash equilibrium? Well, I have to show that uh, none of the players has any incentive to deviate unilaterally, okay? And so uh, let's look at uh, the, the uh, scenarios for deviation, okay? So the question, first of all, one question is, will X deviate? Well, before deviation, I need to, I, I need to calculate X's payoff, and here's the X's payoff, uh, payoff calculation. Think about like X is getting $7 per click uh, in revenue, okay? Now, X will be paying Y's bid. X will not pay his own bid of four dollars per click. X will be paying Y's bid of uh, X will not pay five dollars per click. X will pay actually four dollars per click. Okay. Now, um, as a result, X's payoff is revenue minus price, which is seven minus four dollars per click, which is three dollars per click. Okay. Now, if you want to uh, talk about dollar amounts per hour, the, uh, you have to actually multiply it with, with slot ones. CTR, which is 10 clicks per hour. So if you multiply uh, it with 10, you get $30 per hour. So that is access uh, uh, payoff, okay? Now, let's think about uh, access payoff for deviation. Now, what would be a, a one uh, a scenario of deviation? Well, right now, X is uh, getting assigned slot number one. A X could deviate and could, uh, could actually get slot number two. And to get slot number two, X would have to beat lower than Y. Okay, y is beating 4. So if x beats 3, then x would have gotten um, slot number 2. Let's put 3 here. So this is the alternative scenario, and I'm going to write everything for the alternative scenario in red. Okay, now x beats $3 per click, y4, z1. y is the top guy here, so y will get uh, slot number 1, x will get slot number 2, and z remains at slot number 3. Okay. So this is the scenario for uh, deviation. And in this case, let's calculate access payoff for this deviation. Access revenue per click remains the same, $7 per click. This is the true revenue per click. However, X now will pay Z's bid because Z is the next guy now, uh, which is $1 per click. So seven minus one, that is $6 per click. And if you translate it to dollar amount per hour, you have to actually uh, multiply it with the, uh, with the click through rate of slot number two, which is four, okay? Um, uh, six times four is $24 per hour. So will X have any incentive to deviate? No, why not? Before deviation, he was getting $30 per hour. Per hour. And if he deviates, he will be getting $24 per hour. And those that deviation, if you look at the calculation here, this uh, bid amount, three does not play pay, play any role. What, it, what really matters is the ordering, okay? So for example, X could have bid two, Still, X would have ended up with uh, with a payoff of twenty four dollars per hour. Okay, it's only the ordering that matters. Okay, so in this uh, kind of an argument, you can show that X will have no incentive to deviate, and we can put an answer of no here. Now, how about Y? Well, now if you think about Y, you can apply the same kind of argument, but before that, you have to erase all of the red things that you wrote here, because this deviation is unilateral. Okay. So two, uh, two of the guys, like X and Y, cannot deviate at the same time. So you have to get rid of all of the right things here. And you have to go back to the original situation. Okay, so this is the situation. Now, before deviation, we have to calculate Y's payoff. So let's calculate Y's payoff, just like we did here. So Y's payoff is 
uh, why is revenue per click is six dollars per uh, click six and why is right now paying z's bid which is one dollar per click six minus one that is five dollars per click and if you translate it to dollar amount per hour it would be, you have to multiply it with four so five here times four that is twenty dollars per hour so that is why is payoff here and uh, let's think about the deviation scenario okay. so one deviation could be like why uh, goes bid something below z the other deviation could be why bid something above x okay so uh, these two uh, alternative scenarios will change y's position from 2 to 1 or from 2 to 3 okay so let's look at the uh, significant case where uh, y will be bidding over x okay and for that case, you can consider any value above 5. It does not have to be 6, 7, it could be 100, 500, anything. It does not really matter. Uh, what really matters is the ordering, okay? So let's say Y bids $6 per uh, click, just to go above X, okay? Now, um, th in this alternative scenario, once again, I'm going to draw everything in red. Y is the highest bidder here, so Y will get slot number 1. X is the next highest bidder with 5, X will get slot number 2, Z will get slot number 3, okay? So this, this is the scenario. Now for this red case, Y's payoff is, now uh, Y's payoff would be uh, revenue per click, which is 6, minus how much Y is paying right now, Y will be paying uh, the next highest guy's bid, which is five dollars per click, so six minus five, okay, and per click. And if you translate it to dollar amounts per hour, it would be a, you have to you have to multiply with y's C, uh, the slot number one CTR, which is ten clicks per hour. So multiply with uh, ten, and you get ten dollars per hour, okay. So, uh, question is, will Y deviate? Well, no. Why not? Because before deviation, he was getting $20 per hour, and after deviation, he is getting $10 per hour. So, there is no incentive to deviate. You also have to show the other case, like, uh, what happens if Y bids below Z, let's say zero, $0 per click, and there also you'll see that Y will have no incentive to deviate, okay? So, I'm not showing that case here. So, here, once again, the answer is no. And similarly, uh, you can show the case for Z, uh, and and in this case, you, you can also show that Z will have no incentive to deviate. I'm not showing the actual calculation, but you have to go through the same kinds of argument. Like, what, what would happen if Z goes above Y? Uh, like, right now Z is bidding $1 per click. What would happen if Z bids something like uh, $4.5 per click? Okay? So, you'll see that Z will actually end up with negative payoff in that case. Okay? Negative payoff. So Y will have, Z will have no incentive to deviate in that case, okay. Now, uh, another Nash equilibrium in the same game is, I'm going to write down the, uh, so this is the previous Nash equilibrium, where we had five, four, one. An alternative Nash equilibrium, which I'm going to write down in blue, is three, five, one. So X will be three, Y will be five, and Z will be one. So this blue bidding will give you an alternative Nash equilibrium. There are two Nash equilibrium, and um, uh, so multiplicity of Nash equilibrium is very much frowned upon in economics literature because uh, one of the goals of Nash equilibrium, like studying or adopting the solution concept of Nash equilibrium, is its predictive power. When you have multiplicity of Nash equilibrium, you cannot really tell which one will happen. Okay. Uh, however, on the upside, as we uh, talked about this GSP auction mechanism, we know that in GSP, one of the Nash equilibrium, there could be multi multiple Nash equilibria, but one of them uh, has the nice property of social, uh, 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 social welfare maximization. In one of the Nash equilibrium, the sum of the valuations at that particular assignment would be the maximum possible. Okay? Now, uh, before ending this uh, talk, I'd like to uh, talk very briefly about the three main concepts that we've talked about here, MCP, VCG, and uh, uh, GSP, okay? So first of all, MCP. 
MCP, uh, you talk about price per item. Okay, each price, each item will have a price tag. That's its MCP. Okay. However, VCG is very different from MCP. In VCG, you don't talk about price tags for each item. You talk about how much each bidder or how much each advertiser is hurting others or harming others okay by his presence okay so that uh, notion of harming is more personalized for each uh, advertiser in other words if x and y uh, uh, if x gets slot number one x would be charged some dollar amount if y also gets slot number one why would why could be charged a different dollar amount okay even though both of them are getting slot number one in two different scenarios let's let's say uh, in these two scenarios uh, the, the the amount we charge to x or the amount we charge to y in the under the vcg principle would be very different even though they will be getting the same slot okay so in other words vcg pricing is personalized pricing for each advertiser the personalization comes from this notion of harming Okay, we calculate VCG price as the amount a, a, an advertiser harms other. Okay, now uh, let's talk about uh, the difference between VCG and GSP. Okay, so both of them, uh, the similarity is that both of them can work on uh, multiple items. It's a multi-item auction. VCG is truthful. Uh, every advertiser, uh, it's a dominant strategy for every advertiser to come forward with their true valuations to beat their true valuations. Uh, however, as we saw in GSP, the advertisers might have incentive to lie, okay? And the other thing about, the other nice thing about VCG is that uh, VCG will give you a unique outcome, a unique outcome, and in that unique outcome, uh, the social welfare ma is maximized, okay? Uh, on the other hand, in GSP, there could be multiple outcomes in terms of Nash equilibrium, multiple Nash equilibria, one of them maximizes social welfare, but not all, okay? And some of the Nash equilibria, as we saw, are uh, not truthful, okay? Another valid question that you might ask is, uh, why doesn't Google adopt uh, VCG instead of GSP, okay? So there could be multiple answers. First of all, VCG mechanism is a little bit complicated. The notion of harm, it's, it's not intuitive, uh, and also, the, uh, the first step in VCG is the search uh, company will ask each advertiser to submit their uh, valuations. And we know that valu the number of valuations depend on the number of slots. If there are three slots, each advertiser will have to submit three valuations, one for each slot. Okay? And the calculation of this valuation is also a little bit complicated. You have to multiply the CTR value for that particular slot with, your, uh, with the advertiser's uh, revenue per click okay now um, and also explaining the price that is uh, being charged um, is also a little bit complicated in VCG okay now uh, GSP is much simpler like uh, each advertiser only has to submit one number which is the bid which is the revenue per click and so the mechanism is simpler uh, however, you lose the uh, nice properties of second price sale bid auction. The other answer is, uh, well, there is no theoretical proof of it. The other answer is uh, Google perhaps makes more money uh, by adopting this GSP mechanism compared to what they would have earned, uh, earned uh, if they had adopted VCG mechanism. Okay, So uh, again, do not quote me on it because there is no theoretical or empirical proof of this statement, okay? So with that, I'll end this talk here. Uh, thank you.